walking by all the snow on the ground. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Nope. So good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for our March 1st program with Sean Kornecki of the Gardner Center in Darien. Uh, we're so looking forward to. I'm Robin Bates Mason. I'm co-president of, of um, UK Beautification League and uh, with Jill Ernst who couldn't be here today. Um, so before we start, just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, just want to let everyone know that we have our spring luncheon on March 22nd at Waveney House. And and thanks to Gloria Simon for all of her work for putting that together. If you need more information on that, you can check the newsletter or go to newcanaanbeautification.org. Also, if you have not, please stop by Lee Garden and check out the new gate, uh, which is a huge improvement. And thanks to Rob Carpenter, Peggy Dannerman, Yvonne Hunkler, Kathy Lapola, and Carol Selden for all their work on getting this project finished. Uh, next, we have on April 3rd, we have our joint meeting with New Canaan Garden Club. Uh, Sig Harvey, British fine art photographer and author of Blue Violet, will present her works and books will be available and that will be at New Canaan Library. And lastly, we're very excited. The 2023 annual appeal has launched. Um, you can see our ads right now on New Canaan Night, as well as you'll be receiving our flyer in the mail soon. So please look out for that. And without saying anything else, I'd like to go right to Angela to introduce our speaker. Okay, thank you, Robin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're very happy to welcome back Sean Karenke, the uh, manager of the Garden Gardener Center in Darien. Um, he is here to teach us, um, help us uh, overcome any fears we may have of working with dahlias. If you're like me, you're a little intimidated by dahlias. Um, a little uh, history uh, about Sean, if you have not met him or talked to him before, his interest began um, when he was really young, helping his great grandmother in her garden. And he was fortunate enough to turn that interest into a 30 plus year long career in the horticultural industry, which would be kind of my dream, but that didn't work out. And he's been over at the Gardener's Center since 2006. Um, he is a wealth of knowledge in all things plant. Um, he's always very helpful when I've popped over there and had some questions. Um, and in addition to speaking to us last year, he's also very popular with other area organizations. He hosts workshops in the um, Gardener Center, now in person again, I believe, now that we're post-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, he has tons of... Um, videos that he posts on his website and uh, his topics cover everything. Uh, if you have a gardening question, you can probably find a video or a program that Sean has put on. Everything from uh, starting seeds to pruning to seasonal containers and uh, today, dahlias for us. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Angela. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the participants for tuning in um, to our chat about dahlias this morning. And of course, I'd like to thank the uh, UK and Beautification League for having me back again. Um, I really enjoy doing this sort of thing, especially you know at the end of the winter. I don't get to talk about plants too much over the winter months. So it's nice to be able to do something like this today, which is actually the first day of um, meteorological spring. Um, those are the seasons I go by in the gardening and horticulture world. So meteorological spring is March, April, and May. Meteorological summer is June, July, August, fall being September, October, November, and then winter being December, January, and February. And in the gardening world, that works out a little better than um, the calendar dates because it's based on um, temperature as opposed to the position of the sun in the sky. So it, in the gardening world, you always want to work with, um, with your um, meteorological seasons for sure. So today is, if you're a gardener, the first day of spring. So it's a great day to be talking about dahlias. Um, dahlias were a topic that the New Canaan Beautification League um, selected for me to talk about today. And I was talking with the ladies a little bit before we before we started the meeting. You know, I, I did an interview. I did an interview a couple of years ago. And one of the questions that I was asked, and it was actually a good question and not a question I had been asked before, 
Um, the question was, what's your least favorite plant? And, you know, people ask me all the time what my favorite plant is, but nobody had really ever asked me what my least favorite plant was. And without thought or pause, I said, dahlias. Dahlias are my, my least favorite plant out of all of them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we go along. You know, I absolutely adore dahlias as a gardener, but as a plant retailer, as a guy who sells plants, they're not, they're not particularly my favorite. And We'll talk about we'll we'll talk about some of the reasons why that is as we go um because there's a, quite a few of them i you know i often i often refer to dahlias as the tomatoes of the flower world um because there there's some maintenance involved with dahlias um there's some work there's some maintenance and they are not without their insect and disease problems and we'll we'll certainly be talking about that as we go along for sure um so dahlias i'm going to actually talk a little bit about the history of dahlias before we start talking about their culture and get into nitty gritty of them. So dahlias are part of a huge family of plants known as the Asteraceae. And that's their botanical family, but you know, if we want common names, it's the, um, it's the daisy family. Um, so dahlias are in the daisy family, one of the largest family of plants on, or a family of plants on the, planet um, with representation all over the world. Um, so they're part of the daisy family and they are very, very closely related to um, a North American native that everybody knows, which is um, Helianthus or sunflowers. Um, it's one of their very closest cousins. So Dahlia's you know, helianthus and sunflowers are native to Central North America, you know, the United States and Northern Mexico. Dahlia's indigenous native range originally was um, Central Mexico, Central America, and Northern parts of um, South America. And believe it or not, dahlias have been cultivated for over 2000 years by man. And they weren't cultivated for 2000 years as something to look at because they were pretty. Dahlias were originally cultivated as food um, because dahlia tubers are in fact uh, edible, um, very much so. Um, so they were cultivated for food um, by the Aztecs and the other um, indigenous people of Central, Central America, Mexico and Northern parts of South America. So they were grown as food for their, um, for their tubers, um, which was a, a major food source for them. And they are actually very closely related. You know, I said they were um, very closely related to sunflowers. So if anyone has ever eaten a Jerusalem artichoke, um, Jerusalem artichoke is a helianthus, um, helianthus tuberosus, which would be a very close cousin of the dahlias. Um, so they have a similar similar sort of tuber, and people have been eating Jerusalem artichokes for years, um, and they're they're still popular. I know people still eat Jerusalem artichokes. I see them in the grocery store all the time. So interesting thing about dahlias is yes, they are they're they're edible, and people had been using them for food forever. Um, typically, you would um, you wouldn't cook them. They are typically you would peel the tubers and dice them up and add them to a salad or that sort of thing. Um, they don't cook well but that could be a nice addition to a salad, um, kind of like you might use apples in a salad. They have a similar texture and their flavor is typically described as being kind of bland, you know, kind of like with celery tones, you know, that sort of thing. But if anybody's ever so inclined to uh, try some dahlias in your, in your salad, go right ahead and do that because they are absol absolutely edible plants for sure. And as are the foliage and the, uh, the stems. Um, so, Interestingly enough, used as food. Um, of course, Spanish, when the Spanish came to the New World, they, um, they fell in love with them because they were a new plant and they brought the three, the three indigenous species of dahlias that were in Mexico and Central America, they brought the three types back to, um, to Spain in the um, later part of the 18th century to try as a food crop in, in, in Europe, but they didn't, um, they didn't, they didn't go over well over there apparently. So, but they made it over there. And then of course, in the, um, 
in the 19th century, in the mid part of the 19th century, once we got into the industrial revolution and we started having that steam and mechanized heating mechanisms, you know, people, there, was, there were several huge plant crazes in Europe um, during the um, Victorian era, during the second half of the uh, 19th century. Orchids were a big plant craze in Europe, but that, dahlias were another one. Um, dahlias really took off in Europe during the second half of the 19th century. And thousands and thousands of, uh, of cultivars and hybrids were created. And unfortunately, um, most of those were lost over time. Um, you can go back now and find uh, you know, botanical books from the, eight, from the 19th century with color plates and descriptions of literally hundreds, if not thousands of dahlias that were introduced in Holland and in France during the 19th century that are, that are long gone now. But um, we, still have, we still have plenty of good ones to choose from, that, that's for sure. Um, so and a little interesting history there on the dahlias, um, they, but they are absolutely native to Central and South America for sure. And again, originally, the original interest in them was as food source. Um, so, just a little bit of a, a little bit of a fun fact there. So, there's if anybody's grown roses, and I know a few of you, I think seven or eight of you, were identified as experienced dahlia growers. There's some um, there's different classifications of dahlias, kind of like the way we have roses. With roses, there's hybrid teas and flora bundas and florida flowers, etc. Um, the same it works kind of the same way with the dahlias. I believe. There are 14 recognized classifications of dahlias. I might be a little more, a little less, I'm not positive on that. Um, but I was gonna talk about a few of the more popular ones, the few, the ones that I've been more familiar with and the, more, the ones that we've dealt with more over the, um, over the past 30 plus years that I've been selling dahlias. Um, people tend to, People tend to like the um, the taller ones, um, the taller ones and the larger flowers as opposed to the little guys. So there's quite a number of different ones. So I'm going to just go through a few of them with you here. I'm going to see if I can share a couple of couple of pictures as we go. So this first one here is a, a decorative decorative dahlia. These guys have um, typically have large flowers on large plants. Um, and when I say large plants, we're talking about 36 to 48 inches tall. And, you know, with flowers that could be six to eight inches wide, you know, that sort of thing. Those are the, those are the decoratives. So we have beautiful ones of those, all colors. Um, another good one here, these tend to be a little, these tend to be a little shorter, but these guys are, um, these are usually classified as pom-pom or ball type. Dahlias, and again, you know, huge range of colors on those. Some um, tend to be a little shorter, shorter plants with smaller flowers, but they have certainly have a very unique, um, very unique shape to them for sure. And then we have some little guys here. Like I said, these um, not everybody likes, not everybody likes the little ones, but these are little, um, these are little mignon or single dahlias, which have, I really like these guys. Um, but again, I'll, I'm gonna get into some of the reasons I don't love dahlias as a retailer. And you know, these guys I love because they, they're shorter and their flowers are simpler and they typically don't need to be staked or caged or anything to be, to be held up. They just have a simpler, uh, simpler structure to them. And then we have one of my favorites, probably sell more of these, this type than any. These are um, either cactus or semi-cactus uh, dahlias. And again, these are usually these are usually big plants. And they're kind of unique because they have all, their rays are almost tubular and they have kind of a kind of a dimensionality to them that's really cool. Um, Jamie, our fall director, really loves the cactus and the uh, semi-cactus dahlias for her arrangements. She she uses those all the time. So that's a good one. For, um, for, for as a cut flower. And then, you know, another one here, this is the one that probably everyone knows. These guys are known as dinner plate dahlias. And I, I don't think dinner plate dahlias are actually one of the 14 official classifications of dahlias. I think there's, I think the dinner plates are a couple of the other groups that kind of get lumped into that description of dinner plates. 
just because of the size of their flowers, which can really be up to 12 inches wide in some cases. And that's where, where you really start to see kind of like their, their sunflower lineage. When you think about the size of sunflower, sunflower flowers, some of these, um, some of these dinner plate dahlias can get quite, quite enormous in height in their flowers. So they're really, they're really fun. And we sell, we sell more dinner plates than anyone. That's a, that's a plant that I think, uh, or a name that just draws people to it. it it's just a, because they know this flower is going to be, are going to be big and spectacular. I did, um, I talked, I mentioned Jamie likes to use her, um, the semi-cactus and cactus dahlias in her arrangements. So, so I asked her yesterday, because I don't have a lot of experience personally with dahlias as cut flowers, but she certainly does. So I asked her, her, her professional floral take on dahlias yesterday. And she said that, you know, it's, they, she said they're spectacular cut flowers. Number one, because of the color palette that is offered from them, you can, um, the only color that you can't have a dahlia in is blue. Um, you can have them in every other color. Um, the other thing that makes them really fantastic is the, the different shapes and textures of the flowers. You can really, she said, you could put a whole, uh, you could put a whole arrangement together with just dahlia flowers in between the colors, the flower sizes, and the flower shapes and textures. You can have a, a spectacular arrangement with just dahlias, and I, and I believe her. Um, I asked her if there were any tips or secrets to using dahlias in arrangements, because some flowers do require a little special, special attention when you're arranging with them. And she said, no, she said they, um, she did say they're not the longest lasting flower in arrangement. Uh, most flowers and most cut flowers are in the seven to 10 day range. Um, Jamie mentioned that these are probably more in the values are more in the five to seven day range as far as lasting in a vase. Um, but of course, if you grow your own, you could have an endless, endless supply of them. And her only advice she offered as far as, as cutting them is she said that she did emphasize that you really want to, you want to, you know, cut at a hard angle on the stem to open up the largest surface area you can when you're cutting them to put them in a vase. And then to expect, you know, five to seven days out of them in a vase. Again, if you're, if you're growing your own, you can, um, can, can keep them going all summer long. So that's the, um, those are the different types of dahlias. As far as um, what they like, I'm going to talk about their cultural requirements. I'm going to talk about soil. I'm going to talk about light. I'm going to talk about fertilizer. We're going to talk about watering. And not really a cultural requirement, but something that definitely comes along with your dahlias, if, especially if you're growing the tall ones, is um, there's going to be some staking or caging involved. Um, they are not, with the exception of the short ones, um, most of them are going to need some extra, extra support to stand up, especially the tall ones, the large flowers like the cactus and the decoratives and the um, dinner plates, because they have, their flowers are huge. And a lot of times in the summertime, if they get wet and we have a thunderstorm, it's when you, they'll topple over on you. So you definitely want to you want to stake your dahlias for sure. Um, so as far as soil goes, you know, dahlias are actually pretty forgiving as far as their soil goes. Um, they'll actually grow in a fairly they'll grow in a heavy clay soil if they if they have to. Um, where they don't want to be is is wet. Um, they don't want to be in a situation where it's wet all the time. So a typical, a typical loose, loamy soil is going to be the best place for them. Um, as far as you know, as far as the soil in your garden, you want it to be a loose, loamy. Um, they will, they will tolerate a heavier clay though, as long as it um isn't a, a wet clay situation. So soil, they're they're pretty, they're pretty flexible, and a lot of times, you know, here in in Connecticut, in this part of the world where we garden. A lot of times they're good to go straight in our garden soil here um, without a whole lot of extra attention. So they can typically go right into our garden soil unless it's particularly wet or, or poorly drained area. You'd want to avoid that for them. Um, as far as light goes, dahlias, you know, again, remember they're, they're part of that uh, helianth, they're closely related to the helianthus, the sunflowers. So they really want, they want to be in a sunny spot. Um, dahlias, preferably should get eight hours of full sun a day. I think they would be perfectly happy with a little less than that. Maybe even if it was like in the second half of the day when the sun is stronger, like they got six hours a day, the later half of the day during the summertime, I think they'd be okay. 
Um, but ideally, in a perfect world, dahlias want to be in full sun from sunrise to sunset, just like the ones you see growing in this uh, field behind me without any shade in sight anywhere. So that's where they, that's where they want to be. They want, so the more sun, the better for dahlias, for sure. Um, dahlias are very heavy feeders. So if you are not good about you know, fertilizing plants, you might be disappointed with your dahlias. Um, dahlias definitely benefit at planting time from some addition, addition of some fertilizer in, in the actual planting hole. I like to use bone meal. Um, bone meal is you know, high in phosphorus, which is great for dahlia blooms. Um, so I like to use bone meal at planting time when the tubers go in. Um, and then you can give them supplemental fertilizer during the season, you know, every four weeks. I would use a product like the, I like to use organic products. I like, um, I like plant tone or flower tone. You could even use rose tone. If you guys are familiar with, uh, everybody's probably used the Spoma holly tone before. So Spoma makes a whole series of organic granular products for their, for the garden. And plant tone, rose tone, flower tone would be the ones to use on your dahlias. And you can do that every four to six weeks. I like, I like every four weeks. And the nice thing about those organic fertilizers, such as um, the Espoma product, is they um, they're made of they're made of animal byproducts. So they're made of um, manure, they're made of feather meal, they're made from bone meal. Um, there's often dried manure in there, and the benefit to that, as far as, as as far as your garden is concerned, is you know synthetic fertilizers, besides being terrible for the environment. Um, they're really just all they're really offering to the plants is nutrients. Um, whereas your organic uh, plant and animal based fertilizers actually over time contribute to the soil quality as they break down and they actually improve your soil. And then all of those Espoma's uh, uh, products have um, billions of living microbiology in them now that are dormant. And once they get wet and get into your soil, you're adding a whole bunch of microbial life to your soil, which is really hugely important for the overall health of your plants. So definitely um, fertilize when planting and then four to six weeks with a nice, you know, organic dry fertilizer. I prefer broadcast around the plants during the growing season. Um, they'll be very happy. I mean, dahlias, the more you feed them, the, the better they're gonna be. Um, as far as watering goes, um, water uh, dahlias, don't like to be, as I mentioned when we were talking about the soil, dahlias don't like to be soaking wet all the time. So they, they like water, they need water. They'll let you know very quickly if they're dry, but you really want to, um, you really want to water them thoroughly and then kind of let them dry out a bit. Um, you don't want to maintain constant sogginess around them. That could lead to rot fairly easily. So a good draining soil, regular irrigation, you know, I would tell you dahlias would probably be very happy with maybe an inch to two inches of water a week during the hot part of the summer. Um, and again, if your soil drains really, really well, like I think we have some folks up on Cape Cod with us here today, um, your soil probably drains a lot better than ours does because it's got a large uh, amount of sand in it. So you guys could probably water a little more heavily up there. You probably do already. Um, whereas our soil is a little heavier here. So you got to be careful with the watering, and they'll they'll often let you know when when they're thirsty. Um, they'll wilt a bit. Sometimes they even um, if anyone grows uh, hydrangeas, mop head hydrangeas, classic blue hydrangeas. Um, sometimes you'll see them wilting a little bit in the summertime, when on a hot sunny day, even when you just watered them twenty minutes earlier, and it's just the nature of the beast with hydrangeas and. Um, Dahlias often will do the same thing. You'll often see dahlias wilting slightly a little bit on a really hot day, even though they're they're not dry. So don't don't overwater them. Sometimes they just they just do that during during the during the heat of the day. It's just um, it's the nature of of, of the beast there. Um, again, not really a cultural thing, but the taller dahlias do need staking. And you know this is where going back to the um the, back to the tomato thing again. Um, Anyone, you, everyone's probably grow, is either growing or has grown tomatoes at one point in your life or the other. And everyone who's grown tomatoes knows that they need to be supported. 
Um, it's just something that you know you're going to be doing with tomatoes. Um, the tall dahlias are the same way. Um, a lot of people like to use single stakes, like the nice green bamboo, green bamboo stakes that you can um, kind of disguise amongst their stems. There's also um, there's also grow through rings um, and grow through grid rings that you can install when they're they're small plants and let them grow through that naturally. I really like those. Um, the mistake people make with the grow rings all the time though is um, people always come in in July and August after their plants are already three feet tall and they try to install the grow through ring on them. It's not really how they're meant to, get to work because then it looks like you stuffed your plant into a, into a ring. So they're really meant to be, you want to plan ahead with your with the grow through rings and get them installed on the plants before they're even tall enough to grow through it and then let them grow through naturally throughout the season. And then they kind of like, they kind of disguise the, the growth through as, as you go. But the taller ones, you know, any, any of the dahlias, I, I think that grow over, you know, 24 to 30 inches probably need staking or caging uh, of some sort, of some sort, just so that they don't um, topple over you on you in the summertime when we get those heavy rains and the wind, the, the thunderstorms that, that we typically get. So, Again, you know, I'm, I, I call them the tomatoes of the flower world because they have, um, they have a lot of a lot of issues. You know, there's a lot of it's, they're not an easy plant to grow, um, just like the tomatoes. But everyone grows them anyways because we love them so much. Um, aphids, or oh, I'm sorry, dahlias are appealing to a lot of different insects, um, and they are certainly appealing to wildlife, which we'll be talking about in a second. Um, there are quite a few insects to keep an eye out for when you're growing your dahlias. Um, probably all insects you've heard before, and you guys are probably all gardeners of, in one way or the other. So, some common ones to look for, and there's more. But I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk about the, the five most uh, common ones that you're gonna see on dahlias to keep an eye out for. Um, aphids love dahlias. Everyone's probably seen aphids before, they're usually tiny little green things, or sometimes they're black. If you're growing milkweed, you've probably seen the orange ones before. Um, they usually congregate on the newest growth of whatever kind, whatever host plant they're on. They're usually on the tips. Um, they're fairly easy to see, and they're fairly easy to get rid of. Um, they can be squished with your fingers if you're not very squeamish. You can rinse them off with a strong, but gentle jet of water from the end of your hose, just rinse them right off the tips of the plants and let them land where they where they land. Their, their days are numbered once that happens. Um, another thing you can do, and I do this with milkweed all the time, if you have plants that are vigorous and um, lots of life to go in them, a lot of times I will just, if I find a single stem that's covered with aphids, I'll just cut the whole stem with the aphids off and toss it, um, just to control them that way. I rarely, if ever, recommend spraying pesticides for aphids. They're, they're just too easy to get rid of in more natural ways, unless you have a severe infestation. So aphids are definitely one to look out for. Um, you're typically going to find aphids early in the spring. You know, so we're talking about you know, May, you know, early May, you know, that sort of thing. Um, is usually when they come around the first time early to mid-May. And then they often have a resurgence later on in the summer, usually you know, in the beginning to middle of August and into September, you'll see kind of a second population of aphids coming around. And those are probably the ones that would be more troublesome for your, your dahlias because they're gonna really be cranking you know, by the time it's end of July into August, that's, that's their time. So be, um, be diligent to um, search for aphids on your, on your dahlias. And you'll, if, a lot of times, if you don't see the aphids themselves, there's some, uh, there's some clues, there's some indicators, some um, other, other things will, will, will clue you into their presence. So one of the ways I always find aphids is I look for two other insects, actually three. Um, if you see ants on your dahlias, and this goes for all plants, not just dahlias, if you see ants crawling around on your dahlias, check for aphids. 
if you see houseflies buzzing around your dahlias, check for aphids. And if you see yellow jackets, you know, the, the dumpster bees, the ones that like garbage cans, not, you know, not bumblebees or honeybees, but I'm talking about the dumpster bees. If you, the ones that get nasty when you go near them. If you see yellow jackets buzz, buzzing around your dahlias, check for aphids. Um, aphids are unable to digest sugar and in their excrement, which is called honeydew, it's very sticky and it usually gets all over the leaves and the stems. That honeydew that the aphids are excreting is very attractive to the ants and to the houseflies and to the dumpster bees. So if you see those guys, take a closer look. I guarantee you're going to find aphids. That's a, it's guaranteed. Um, so let those guys be your let those guys be your your, your warning sign there. Um, a couple other things that find Valley is appealing. Um, several different caterpillars. Um, there's a few different caterpillars that like that like values very much. Um, so keep an eye, your eyes peeled for caterpillars. Caterpillars are usually going to cause, you know, skeletonization of the leaves or irregular holes in the leaves. A lot of times you may see petals disappearing from flowers or petals that are look like they may have been ripped off or torn off. Uh, you want to check for caterpillars if you see that kind of damage. And caterpillars, are again, they're, they're, you can pick them off by hand if you find them. Um, that's a good way to get rid of them. The other way to get rid of caterpillars is with a product called uh, BT, which is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacterium, it's a live bacterium in a bottle. And the only thing, and it's not a poison, it's the reason we sell BT for caterpillars is because the only thing that's going to kill is caterpillars. It's a very specific, um, and it's not a poison. It, what it really does is it's a live bacterium. The caterpillars eat it. It gets into their di digestive system. They get very sick, and they die eventually because they stop eating. It's not a product that you're going to spray on the caterpillars, and they're going to keel over and fall off the plant five minutes later because it's not a poison. But if you're growing dahlias, if you're concerned about the environment, if you're concerned about bees and butterflies and hummingbirds and all those other guys, and you know you have caterpillars, there's, there, it, you, you absolutely want to use a product that's going to target just the caterpillars and do it naturally without causing any harm to any other bugs or to your kids or your pets or to the environment. So always know what you're insect problem is and then treat that problem with the product that's going to go after that insect specifically. Um, I've been telling people for many years and we haven't sold products in many years. A lot of times you'll go into, I'm not going to mention any stores, but a lot of times you'll go into some of the bigger uh, home improvement centers. And if you're looking for something to spray on your, on your dahlias to get rid of caterpillars, you're going to see a whole bunch of products that brag that they kill over 300 insects or kills over 200 listed pests. Um, don't use those products. Um, those products are terrible for the environment and they do a tremendous amount of collateral damage because obviously if, it's, if the product's going to kill 300 different kinds of insects, but you only have one kind of insect, um, there's no reason to use a product like that ever. Um, and we haven't carried products like that here at the Garter Center in many, many years. So always, just like when you go to the doctor, identify the problem and then treat for the problem. There is no reason to treat for, for everything if you, only, if you only have one thing. So caterpillars. Another big one, uh, slugs. Everybody knows what a slug is. Um, a slug is basically a snail without a shell. Slugs are interesting. They're not because they're not insects, um, they're mollusks, like I said, snail without a shell. Um, so insecticides are not gonna do anything for slugs. So even if, even though a slug may look like a caterpillar and it causes the same kind of damage as a caterpillar, the, the BT spray for caterpillars isn't gonna do anything for slugs because um, they're not even closely related, completely, completely different animals. So slugs, but again, they're very easily treated. There are, there are pellets that you sprinkle around. And if anybody's, I'm sure there's probably 
at least a dozen people with hostas that have slug problems. Slugs love hostas. And there's all sorts of different slug pellets that you can use that, that are natural. And again, you're going to sprinkle them around the base of your dahlias. The pellets are going to get wet. The slugs are going to come and eat the pellets, and the slugs are going to perish. But you're not going to be wiping out all the other bugs in the community with, with slug pellets. Because again, if you know you have slugs, treat the slugs. Don't treat for everything. Um, so slugs, watch for, watch for damage for them. They're nocturnal. They don't come out during the daytime because they, they have to stay wet all the time and they'll dry out in the sun. So you'll often see their damage. And you can tell the best way to tell the difference between slug and caterpillar damage is caterpillar damage is typically at the tops of plants because you have butterflies and you have moths, you know, flying around and laying their eggs, usually on the tops of the plants. If you see irregular holes and tears in skeletonization on the bottom leaves of plants, and again, not just dahlias, this, this, is, good, this is good advice for any kind of plant as you're, as you're scouting and you're trying to figure out what your, what your insect problem is. Um, damage to the lower leaves is almost always slugs because the slugs live on the ground, they're nocturnal. Um, they disappear either under the plant or into loose soil, under a board, under a rock during the daytime, and then at night they come back out and do their damage. But they're not climbing to the tippity top of, of the dahlias to do that. If you've ever seen a slug move um, before, it would take it its entire lifetime to get to the top of the dahlia and back. So bottom leaf damage is always, always slugs. So again, treat with, treat with slug pellets uh, to solve that problem. And the slug pellets are nice because you can really you can put them down every two or three, sometimes even every four weeks, and you'll have effective control all season. So if you if you're growing dahlias and you have slug problems, or if you have grow if you grow any plants, again the hostas, um, slugs are something you definitely want to treat for before you start getting serious damage. As soon as you see the signs of slug damage, get your pellets down. You can keep them at bay for the entire growing season very easily. Another insect. This is a big one. Um, this insect's double trouble uh, because not only does it cause um, not only does it cause damage to the plants, but it's also a, it's also responsible for transmitting diseases and uh, more importantly uh, viral diseases, which we'll be talking about next after after the insects are um, thrips. And if, if anyone's growing roses, you may be familiar with thrips. Um, thrips are, they're, they're my least favorite insect for sure. And Joy, our greenhouse manager is no fan of thrips either. Um, thrips are very small. Um, they tend to get into places where you can't really see them easily or spray them easily. So thrips, is in for, in the, same for roses and dahlias, they love to get themselves into the unopened flower buds of roses and dahlias. Um, and they'll, you'll often know, you'll never see the insects themselves, but you'll see their damage because it's pretty, pretty typical of thrips to have a very specific type of damage. If you see your flower buds kind of bending over, turning brown before they've opened. Sometimes it may look like somebody took a bite out of half of it. Um, those are thrips. And thrips just kind of hang around inside flower buds. That's their favorite place to be. They'll sometimes get the stems as well, but it's usually the flower unopened or slightly opening flower buds is where, is where they get to. I like to, um, I like to just take my pruners and cut off the buds with the thrips in them and get rid of them. Um, it's, it's, you know, they're rarely in every single flower bud, um, but best thing to do is scout for them. Um, know what thrift damage looks like. They're always in the unopened buds. Know what your thrift damage looks like and just carry your pruners with you. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes we have to sacrifice a few flowers, but thrips aren't easy to spray for because they're inside flower buds typically. And in order to treat them inside the flower buds, you would have to use a systemic spray. 
and those are the sprays that get absorbed um, into the plant itself, and then they kill the, the thrips eventually. Um, but again, I'm not, you know, we're not a fan of, of systemic sprays. It's they're they're the worst of the worst as far as uh, pesticides go. So know what your thrip damage looks like. Keep your pruners with you and throw the get your thrip buds into a plastic bag and you know make sure they go out with the household trash. You don't want to put them in the compost pile or throw them in the yard somewhere because they can eventually just get out of there and get back to where we don't want them. So scout for thrips, um, distorted, yellowing, browning, partially chewed looking flower buds. Keep an eye out for those and, and just pick them off and, and you get them out of your life. Um, so thrips, besides causing damage to the flowers, um, they also carry disease from plant to plant. So like I said, they're double trouble. Um, they are notorious for spreading viral diseases. So that's why it's very important to keep an eye out for thrips. And if you do have a plant that has a huge thrip infestation, um, it's something you might want to consider just throwing away. Um, we have here at the store in our in our indoor greenhouse, our tropical plants. You know, we occasionally, you know, we're a plant store. Plants come in from Florida all the time, and occasionally we have to spray plants for spider mites or mealybugs, that sort of thing. Um, our policy with thrips here at the Gardener Center is if a plant comes in with thrips, the plant goes in the dumpster. Um, we don't spray, we don't spray them, we don't try to eradicate them. They're 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 just too much trouble. Um, they cause too many problems. So be on the lookout for thrips because not just the damage they cause, but they spread disease as well. Um, not super common. I'm going to talk about the, the common um, dahlia diseases and I know many of you are already growing dahlias and I know you're probably all all too well familiar with the first one which is powdery mildew. Um, powdery mildew is one, is one of those things that um, dahlias almost always seem to get um, usually late summer you know August September just when they're starting to look their best and do their thing um, here comes the powdery mildew. Um, it's a white, dusty, it's a white, dusty um, appearance on, on the leaves. And it can be on any part of the plant. Um, it can be on the new growth, it can be on the old growth, on the bottom, on the top. It's usually caused by humid, wet weather, um, late, late in the summer, you know, late, mid, mid to late summer. And it spreads quickly. Um, it's, Diseases are different than insects as far as as far as preventing and treating. You know, insects. You know, we never we never preventatively spray for insect problems. But fun, fun, uh, fungus and diseases are a different story. Um, it's okay to preventively spray for things, especially disease, especially if you know you're going to have it. Um, so dahlias. If you grow flocks, you know what powdery mildew is. If you grow bee balm or monarda, you know what powdery mildew is. If you have lilacs in your yard, you probably know what powdery mildew is. Um, those plants are very prone to it. And if, you, if you're growing plants that you know are gonna get powdery mildew every year, um, spray to prevent the powdery mildew. Um, diseases are very easy to prevent. They're much harder to eradicate. So, and there's all sorts of organic protectant fungicides that you can start spraying with early in the season so the so the so powdery mildew never even becomes an issue so it's okay to spray to prevent powdery mildew especially like i said if you're growing a plant that you know is going to get it at some point um don't be afraid to start spraying for powdery mildew you know with dahlias i would probably i love to use holidays as, as references in gardening i do it all the time um I would start spraying your dahlias for powdery mildew right around the 4th of July. Um, and there's lots of organic natural products that work really, really well to prevent powdery mildew. And I would start spraying them right around the 4th of July and keep on going right until, um, right until the end of September, um, every, every two weeks or so, just to keep them, keep them clean throughout the season. Um, another one you will see commonly on 
values. And again, we have dolly growers here. I'm sure you know um, this one as well, which is a botrytis blight. Um, botrytis is kind of similar, similar in a way to similar in a way to um, powdery nola. It, it's brought on by the same conditions. It's brought on by humidity. It's brought on wet by wetness. We get three days of rain. You're probably going to get botrytis on your dahlias. You know, three steamy rainy days during the summer. Um, botrytis usually leaves kind of like brown, sunken, water-soaked um, spots on the leaves. Um, that's a common sign of botrytis. And then on the flowers, it's, it manifests itself a little differently. It'll, it'll almost look like a, like a mold. Like if you ever had um, moldy strawberries in the refrigerator or blueberries where you get that kind of fuzzy gray mold. And if you, if you brush it, it kind of like, kind of, it's like dust and it kind of blows in the breeze. Um, botrytis will often appear that way. Um, but again, just like I said about the powdery mildew, if, you, if you've experienced botrytis and you know you were probably going to get it on the plants you're growing because it's very common on dahlias, start spraying around the um, 4th of July for prevention of botrytis. Because again, easy to prevent, tough to eradicate. A um, couple other ones here. Um, stem rot, another reason, um, another reason or another disease that's pretty common to dahlias. And again, they don't like, you know, excessive, excessive wetness in the summertime brings on most of these diseases. Because remember, these guys are all originally native, they're genetics, they're, they're native to Mexico and Central and Northern South America. So they're used to growing in a, in a climate where the atmosphere is dry. You know, they get water, but it's not a, a, a humid you know, environment. They grow you know, at higher elevations in places where, it's, where it's, the air is dry. So excessive moisture here in the Northeast is, is bad for them and stem rot is pretty common. It's, you know, it's one of the reasons I don't like selling dahlias in pots as a plant retailer in the summertime. Um, Number one, as and as you guys all know, dahlias really don't start blooming here in the Northeast in, until very late. Um, they usually don't start blooming until the end of July if you're lucky. And usually it's more August and then into September is really their time to shine. So it's they kind of they kind of don't fit into the the retail window of plant sales here at the garden at the gardener center or at any nursery really because most people have bought their plants by the time dahlias are are looking their best and you know to have them here in the greenhouse in the heat of July and August you know all these all these things I'm talking about I, I know firsthand just from having the plants on the shelf here in the store or even sometimes just for a few days. And they'll end up with stem rot or botrytis or mildew in that steamy part of the summer, which is the reason I, we we only sell dahlia tubers here. I don't I don't bring dahlia plants in at all for that reason. Um, so stem rot again, it's just from excessive moisture, and you'll usually see a, an entire stem just kind of wilt and keel over. Um, that's a, a clear indication of stem rot, and it's usually because the plant got too wet. Um, and, it, and, the, and the tubers are rotting and it's causing uh, stem rot as well. Um, <clears throat> again, you know, with the whole tomato analogy here, unfortunately, wildlife, deer, rabbits, woodchucks, they, they like dahlias. Um, I've had people over the years tell me that they've had Good luck with dahlias not being um, eaten by wildlife. And I'd actually be curious to know what all you guys' experience is with that. Um, but they are, and I've often seen dahlias described as deer resistant, um, but I don't, I don't believe that to be true. Um, I know wood trucks love them, um, and I know rabbits eat them. And the other kind of thing that makes me doubtful that they're, they're resistant to deer browse is, you know, people can eat them. Uh, you know, they're, they're a food source for humans. 
And typically, if it's if it's a plant we can eat, um, everybody else can eat it too. I mean, just think about your vegetable garden. That's the reason you have to, we have to put eight foot fences around them. If you live in an area with deer and other animals, because they love all of the vegetables. So those are just some, you know, those are just some common common diseases in insects. Unfortunately, it's not all of them, but there are certainly other problems. But those are those are the most common ones. But you know, my whole I just wanted to go over over the basic ones and to really kind of drive home that whole know what your issue is, whether it's an insect or a disease, and then find the product to treat that specific thing. Um, never never use a product that kills everybody or treats every disease. Um, it's just it, it's just overkill. So that we did we talked about cultural requirements we talked about insect and disease problems we talked about the unfortunate fact that animals like to eat dahlias um now i'm going to talk about the part this is usually the deal breaker as far as selling dahlias to people this is the part where once we get past all of the the insects and the diseases and the animals and the staking then we have to talk about the digging up and the storing and the dividing of the values, which is a, a big chore that many people don't want to don't want to do. But I will tell you this: I've had many people over the years who have bought values and said, "Can I can I plant these and just not dig them up? Can I just plant these and and use them as an annual?" And of course you can. Um, you can absolutely do that. Um, people do that with things like tropical hibiscus, uh, you know, mandevilla vines. A lot of people grow mandevilla vines every year. I know I sell hundreds of them. Um, people don't keep them from year to year. You let your mandevilla vine do its thing and then you get a new one the next spring and I'd like to thank all the people who do that with their mandevillas. It's very, it's very, very good for the nursery industry that we, we treat them that way in cold climates. Um, but yes, you can absolutely use your dahlias as annuals. You don't have to dig them up and store them every year. It's a choice, the choice you can make. But I will tell you this: I've had many people over the years who have decided they were gonna use their dahlias as annuals, but then decided to dig them up and, and bring them in the house. Because I've literally taught to dozens of those people over the years who had tended to let them freeze to death, but then they came in to find out. At the very end of the summer, what they had to do to save them for the next year because they fell in love, and that's uh, that's very easy to do with dahlias. So, this is going to be my little my little speech on digging, storing, and dividing. Um, I know we have some folks listening today. I think it might be in different parts of New England. So, I'm going to talk about some kind of specific date ranges when I'm talking about cutting back and digging and storing and all that stuff. Um, these, the date ranges that I'm going to talk about are very specific here to southwestern Connecticut. Um, so if you're gardening in a different part of New England and you don't know first and last frost dates and the date your soil freezes, you know, that, you know, that sort of thing, um, find your best local garden center and go ask the crew there when your first frost, your last frost, when does the ground freeze? They're going to know and they'll, they'll steer you in the right direction, you know, with, with those dates for sure. Um, so this is, the, this is the chore that most people don't want to get involved with the values, but it's really, not, it's really not that hard. And I think it's actually kind of therapeutic. So if you intend to store, to keep, and reuse your values, you got to do if you got to there's, there's three there's two things you have to do you, you have to dig them up and you have to bring them in the house and store them that has to happen for sure and then at some point in time you're going to want to divide them and you know you're going to get free dahlias from from dividing them so these are you know these are things you're going to want to do so here's what we have to do first step and the people a lot of people make a mistake with this one um, especially new dahlia growers because everybody knows dahlias aren't hardy in Connecticut. Um, dahlias are a zone eight or better plant. You need to be in zone eight. So, you know, you're, we're, we're talking about like coastal South Carolina, coastal Georgia, 
in North Florida, you know, you have to be a, in a zone eight climate to keep your dahlias in the ground over the winter. They, they just won't work, you know, they won't work here. So they're not cold hardy, but we do kind of need to let the, dolly, the top parts of the dahlias uh, freeze to death um, before you dig them out of the ground. Um, a lot of people think because they're not hardy, they need to dig them up before the weather gets cold. And I get people in here in September all the time looking to buy peat moss and vermiculite to store their dahlia bulbs in. And it's like, well, you have to, you know, you have to slow, slow down a bit because you're almost two months too early to be doing that. So what we need to do with the dahlias, um, we need to let them be killed. The top part of the plant be killed. The, the, the tubers are hardy to 20 degrees um, in the, down in the soil. The, our soil temperature doesn't go down to 20 degrees until at least you know, Christmas. And sometimes it's even later than that. I mean, it, so don't, you don't have to worry about the tubers so much. You have, you have a pretty good window of opportunity to get those out of the ground. So what we want to do, we want to let the we want to let our first killing frost take care of the dahlias. We want them to be dead, just like this. Um, so this is what we want our dahlias to look like before we dig them and before we cut them back. So here in southwestern Connecticut, so we're going to be talking about Killing frost, we're going to be talking about cutting back, we're going to be talking about digging them up. All of these things in this part of Connecticut are going to be happening again. I love holidays. All of these things are going to be happening between Halloween and Thanksgiving. Um, that's your that's your time frame where this is going to happen. You know, it takes more, it takes more than a light frost to do this. Our you know, our first frost of the fall here in this part of Connecticut is usually the last week of October, first week of November. It's usually right in that window there. But any, if any of you garden, you know, those first couple of frosts we have are often kind of fickle. Um, you may walk out the door and find frost on your windshield of your car, but all of your plants still look fine. So we're not waiting, you know, we're not waiting for first frost to dig the dahlias out of the ground. We're waiting for your first killing frost or freeze. And you will know, you will know right away when your dahlias have frozen to death because they are incredibly dramatic about it, like you see in the picture here. Um, if any of you guys have mop head hydrangeas at home, you know, the blue guys, the big blue mop head hydrangeas, dahlias perform the very, or, present the very similar way when they freeze for the first time, just like the hydrangeas, the leaves that are fine one day and then the next morning you go out and they're all black mush. Um, dahlias are the same way and they're the same way for the same reason. Um, mop head hydrangeas and dahlias have a tremendous amount of moisture content in their stems and leaves. So when they freeze for the first time, there's catastrophic cell damage and then the plants present themselves as this black mush like we see here in the picture. So you wanna wait for that, you want, you want that to happen. You wanna wait for that to happen before you cut them back. And then you're gonna cut them back. And again, we're talking about between, um, we're talking between Halloween and Thanksgiving, all this will be going on. So then you're gonna cut them back. You're gonna cut them back to four to six, four to eight inches high, sort of thing like you see in the picture here. I tell you right now, these people might have cut their dahlias back too early. They still look a little, a little green to me. Um, but that's the height you want to cut them back to. After you cut them back, and again, the mistake people make is they cut them back and then they dig them up. Um, after you cut them back like this, you actually want to let them stay that way for about 10 to 14 days. Um, it's going to do a couple of things. It's going to, um, it's going to help the bulbs to, to cure somewhat. It's also going to, more importantly, 
it's gonna it's gonna hopefully stimulate some eye activity in in the tubers, some eye growth in the tubers, which we'll talk about in a second. So that's going to be important when it comes to dividing them. So killing frost, black mush, cut them back to four to six inches, and then you're going to let them stay this way till for about 10 to 14 days, just like this. Then hopefully, you know, again, we're going to, we're talking about mid November now in a, in a perfect world. Um, hopefully we have a few days in there where it doesn't rain and the soil is nice and dry and you can dig the dahlias at that time. Um, they're not pleasant to dig it out of wet soil, um, but usually if we can get a period of time in there after the 10 to 14 days, you know, you get that window, dig, in the, dig them up in the dry soil. Um, always use a fork, um, a digging fork. Don't use a shovel. Um, shovels often chop them in half. You know, the forks are a little more forgiving. Even if you get a little too close to the clump, you can always, um, often the tines of the fork will kind of go in between the, the tubers and not cause too much damage while they're in there. But you can dig them up at that time um, with the fork, hopefully in a nice dry day. And then you want to get them out and you want to, you want to shake off as much of the soil as you possibly can. And then after you dry, you shake off as much of the soil as you possibly can. It's often good to rinse them. Um, you can do that two ways. You can do it with a with a nice uh, stream from your garden hose. You know, lay them out on the lawn, lay them out in the garden somewhere, rinse all the loose soil off of them. Um, some some people like to use a bucket, um, a big five gallon bucket or something. You kind of dip them in there and kind of sluice them around and rinse all the soil off. And then you're going to um, your next step is going to be moving them to their storage place, but you want to um, give them a good 24 to 36 hours to dry after you um, after you move them, after you rinse them. You want to give them 24 to 36 hours to dry in a in a in a dry, not too warm place. Um, just to let them air dry up before a storm. Um, as far as storing them goes, um, there's lots of options. Some people like to use cardboard boxes. Some people like to use baskets or bushel baskets or wicker baskets, do that sort of thing. My, my great grandmother, who I, all my first gardening experiences came from, from Anna Humphrey. Um, she used to, um, she used to cut the, um, the legs off her retired pantyhose and she would stick all her dahlia tubers in there and, and hang them up all over the um, back end of the house for the, for the winter, so she, she was repurposing her, um, she was repurposing her pantyhose, but Nana H was born in 1900 and she was a truly a, a, a depression lady for sure. And nothing went, nothing was ever wasted, but she all, her dolly has always made it just hanging up in the old, in the old pantyhose in the back end of the house. So baskets, boxes, um, think about, on, you know, think about the mesh bags that onions and potatoes come in, you know, that's the same idea because onions and potatoes are, 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 they're bulbs, really, they're bulbs and tubers and they're, and they're being stored. So you want to think about it the same way and what you store them in is up to you. Um, some people just put them in a basket or bag, you don't put them in anything. Um, it, it's really going to depend now on the environment where you're storing them. Um, because the idea is to keep them dormant over the winter and to keep them from growing and to keep them from rotting and to keep them from drying out. So there's, there's a couple of things you're trying to accomplish. So once you dig them, once you are ready to store them, well, where in the house is that gonna be? Well, it could be a couple of places. And again, we, I, wanna, I want us to think about um, storing potatoes and storing onions. You, you wanna store the, the dahlia, dahlias in a very similar, if not the same situation. Um, we, don't put that, we don't put onions or potatoes in the refrigerator, that's too cold. Um, you might not wanna leave them out on the top of the kitchen counter either because that's too warm. So you wanna find a spot in the house where it's cool um, dahlias can easily go down to 
45, 40 degrees in the wintertime without a problem. Um, you don't want to let them freeze. Um, but the cooler temperatures are definitely going to are definitely going to prevent any kind of growth, which you don't want to happen in the wintertime. You know, and again, potatoes, we've all left potatoes under the counter for too long and the eyes start to grow. Um, probably because they're too warm, they've been there for too long. So that's exactly what you're trying to prevent from happening with the dahlias. So a cool temperature is gonna find is gonna work that it's gonna work best for you. And again, it could be it could be as low as 40 degrees as long as it doesn't freeze. So cool dark dry place cool dark wet cool dark humid doesn't work and it's also so we got to find the cool place we got to find the dark place and then the the whether that area is wet or really dry is going to kind of determine the media you store your values in if you or if you even have to it's like I said, if you have just the right spot, you can put them in a mesh bag and leave them be. But we also have to prevent them from drying out over the winter. So if you have a cool place that's still relatively humid in the wintertime, which isn't easy to replicate in the house. I have it. My house is 125 years old and I have a an unfinished dirt floor basement with an actual root cellar in it and it's usually like 45 50 degrees and kind of damp down there all winter so i could probably get away with not having to add any moisture to the dahlia tubers storing them over the winter but if you have a drier place the media you store them in will probably need to be a little damp um, not wet but it may have to have some moisture to it just to prevent them from desiccating. Um, most people use peat moss or vermiculite to store the dahlias in. And this will, vermiculite and peat moss will work if they're in a basket or a, um, or a box, that sort of thing. But slightly damp if they're in a dry, cool place. And if you don't know, you know, the first year you try storing your dahlias, because that was one of the things I was going to suggest next, is you want to you want to check on them occasionally while they're in storage. You know, you know, go down, take them out, look at them, make sure they're not shriveling. If they're starting to get wrinkly, like a raisin, they're drying out. Um, if they smell or they're starting to get soft spots on them, you know, again, think think about potatoes that have been in storage for too long. Um, they they present the same way. Um, then they're then they're they're getting rotted. They're probably too wet, you know. So check on them, check on them occasionally. Um, you know, it's, gardeners get bored during the winter. Uh, why not check on the check on the dahlia tubers? It's it's something to do. Um, and check on them, and then always divide your tubers in the springtime. Um, some people like to do it in the fall. I think you're opening yourself up to potential disease and rot issues while they're in storage doing it in the fall. I personally always recommend putting them away just the way you dug them out. And then in the spring before planting, you can um, you can get them out into, or you can take them out and divide them. Um, the dividing dahlias is one of the scarier parts of dahlias, I find people. Um, people's opinion is that it's the scariest part. So I do have a Show one more picture here of a uh, dahlia tuber. So, so this was a, a pretty good image I found of a dahlia tuber, although for some reason it reminds me of a tarantula every time I look at it, which I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of spiders. So, but anyways, this is um this is a great picture because it's showing <clears throat> it's showing three parts. You know, it's showing it's showing the um, the tuber itself here at the bottom, the bulbous part. It's showing the neck of the dahlia, which is the um, or the neck of the dahlia tuber, which is that long elongated piece in the middle there. And then right around the the center there, where those green rings are, um, that part is the crown. Um, and you can see the top there where the where the where the mother plant was, where the stem where the plant was, 
Um, that's the crown. That's the part you're kind of, you're not really going to be disposing of. So what the green circles there are representing when you're dividing your dahlia tubers, you want to make sure you have a tuber and neck and part of the crown, um, preferably part of the crown with an eye on it. Um, don't stress out too much if the crown doesn't have an eye on it, because sometimes it just hasn't developed yet. It's not the end of the end of the world if it doesn't. Um, but in a perfect world, you're going to grab a chunk of that crown like that, and preferably with, with an eye or two on it. But like I said, don't stress out. Don't stress out if the um if the um if there's if there's no visible eye there. It's not the end of the world. And if you're if you're growing your own dahlias and dividing them, you're going to have every year. You're going to have more and more. So you're going to have going to have plenty of plenty of dahlia, plenty of dahlias, dahlias for everyone. Um, the only other thing that I would really share with the storing is some people like to use like a sulfur dust, um, which is a which is which is a, a sulfur. It's a, a fungicide. Um, and you can dust your dahlia bulbs with, um, with sulfur to prevent disease over the winter. But, you know, again, with diseases and with, with, um, with, with, in, with insects and such, sometimes I like to kind of wait and see if it's going to be an issue before I treat for it. So that's, that's what I have for dahlias for us this morning. I think we did okay for time. Um, but that's that's my dahlia presentation and i really i really enjoyed doing it and i hope um i hope you guys even you guys who are identify as experienced dahlia growers um learn a few things so th thank you all for listening and i think we're going to do um I know we're going to do Q and A for sure. Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, let's see. I'll just. Can you hear me? Okay. Absolutely. We do. Okay, great. You can come off. Uh, go back on video. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. So. Let's see, the first question we have, um, uh, one participant has asked about watering what, the soil when you first plant it. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks like they tend to not water the first, as soon as they plant it and wait a little bit. So do you recommend waiting or watering uh, deeply when you do plant? So excellent question. Um, it would really, it, this is when we're planting them back out in the garden and it, it's really going to depend on the moisture content of the soil when you plant them. If the soil is very dry and, you know, typically, you know, we're planting dahlias, we're planting dahlia tubers here in this part of Connecticut, usually in the middle part of May, maybe a little earlier than that. Um, the soil is rarely dry here at that time of year. So if the soil is moist, and I don't even want to say wet because it doesn't even have to be wet, it just has to have some kind of moisture to it. Like if you can take a, some soil in your hand and, and, and squeeze it and it sticks together like a little, little snowball, if there's any kind of moisture to it, I, I would hold off on the water for sure. Um, again, like I said, the soil is typically already wet here in May. And May is also not a particularly dry month. We usually get regular rainfall here. And it's, um, it's, it's very easy after you've spent the entire winter carefully storing your dahlia bulbs and preventing them from rotting. It's very easy to undermine all of that in the spring by planting them in soil that's wet and then soaking them with water. Because remember, they're, they're still dormant. They don't have any roots. So they're not really drinking yet. So putting them into an excessively wet soil or a soil that's already wet and then deep watering them would be kind of curtains. So I would definitely put them in as is. And if the soil if the soil has any kind of moisture content to it, I would um, I'd give them a couple of weeks before I started any kind of supplemental irrigation. Because again, soil's wet already and 
we get pretty regular rainfall in May. So I would I would just, I would recommend just planting them and give them a few weeks, maybe even before, maybe even wait until you see some growth above the ground to start watering them, unless it's you know unless we don't have rain. Good, good. Um, another viewer asked about earwigs. Are they a problem, and what can we do about those on dahlias? They are. They're one of the many dahlia insect problems that I, om I omitted from the list. But yes, earwigs are, are a problem for dahlias. Um, the good thing about earwigs is the same pellets that you buy to control slugs can be used to control earwigs. Um, they're attracted to eating the pellets just the same way the slugs are, even though one's an insect and one's a mollusk, like we talked about earlier. Um, the slug pellets do double, double duty with earwigs, and earwigs also behave very similarly to slugs, where they rarely see earwigs during the daytime unless you like lift a log up or turn a rock over, because again, they're nocturnal insects. So you can you can use the slug, the same product you would use for your slug control to keep your um keep your earwigs at bay for sure. Excellent, that's good. Um, speaking of slugs, do you recommend um, using crushed eggshells to deter slugs? You you can use crushed egg cell eggshells to deter them. Um, another product that I like that uh, you can use for um, for deterrent of slugs, and it actually would work as a deterrent for the um, earwigs as well, because they're another they're on the they're on the ground at night, just like the slugs are. Um, is diatomaceous earth. Um, diatomaceous earth is the little, um, it's actually harvested from the seabed. It's actually the little skeletons of um, microscopic single celled algae. Um, but it's made, it's 100% silica. So what it is, is it's basically glass, but microscopic glass. And you sprinkle the dust around the plants and a, a slug, if a slug passes through it, it's going to cause lots of little lacerations in the slug's body, which is going to um, dehydrate and kill the slug. And likewise with the um, with the earwigs, um, as they crawl through it, the diatomaceous earth will get lodged. Remember, because it's microscopic glass, the diatomaceous earth will get lodged in their joints of their legs, in their body, and they will also get sliced up and, and dehydrate as well. So I like it. You can certainly use eggshells if you have them and don't mind crushing them up and throwing them out there. Um, but the diatomaceous earth works better because it works, micro, it's microscopic and it's just, it's more effective against the earwigs and the slugs. If, um, if somebody wants to start them in pots, when, when can they be started in pots indoors? So dahlia tubers indoors in pots, which is good. That's, that's, that's a, a great thing to do. Lots of people do that. So I would start those inside, you know, I would start them for, for, for either for planting outdoors or for being displayed outdoors in the pot. I would start them inside four weeks before our last frost. So our last frost is right around May 15th here. So I'd probably start them right around mid to second, third week of April. Um, they come up, they, they, they come up pretty quick once you pot them up. So you don't want to start them in the house too early, you know, like things from seeds like vegetables that maybe started six to eight weeks before the last frost. Um, I wouldn't go too early with the dahlias. I would think um, April 15th with the idea of putting them out on May 15th would be perfect timing for that. Uh, is there a book you recommend uh, that is uh, informative about dahlias? Uh, not a book. I would absolutely direct everybody to the American Dahlia Society uh, website, though, for sure. Um, they are they're the Dahlia people. Um, they have a whole list of books there, um, but there's also an incredible amount of um, information right there on their website. Good. Um, as far as having them out in the garden with other plants, what uh, plants do you recommend as companion plants for dahlias? 
Uh, they, you know, they mix, they mix so well with other things. And <clears throat> my great grandmother, Nana H, I'm talking about Nana H again. Um, Nana H always mixed them with her vegetables, um, which may, may sound bizarre, um, but we have to remember my grandmother was one of the ones that actually was still eating the Dahlia tubers. Um, and they are really, they're good companion plants for vegetables because one of the things you want to do with your vegetables is attract pollinators. You want to attract bees and pollinators to your vegetables, to your tomatoes, into your, into your peppers and your eggplants. So they work fantastic as companion plants with vegetables. And another nice thing is if you're growing vegetables, you may already have that set up in a way where you're preventing wildlife and deer from getting in there. So it's another good spot for them to be. And plus they like to be staked and caged. So they, they mix really well there. But you know, other than the vegetable garden, they also mix absolutely fantastically in mixed perennial borders. And one of the reasons I like to use them in mixed perennial borders is obviously, you know, most of our perennials bloom for a period of time. You know, they bloom in the spring or maybe they bloom early summer. There's very few perennials that are in bloom at all, you know, the entire season. So dahlias are nice back of or middle of the border filler for perennial beds to kind of make sure that you have color there all the time, even as the other guys are coming in and out of bloom. So I love them in the mixed perennial beds. And then of course, if you wanted to do them in a mixed planting with, um, with annuals, I think they would look spectacular with other, you know, other tall growing annuals like um, maybe Cosmos or some of the taller zinnias or even, you know, Cleome, you know, that sort of thing as a mixed, um, as a mixed um, tall annual border for sure. So lots of, lots of ways to use them well. Um, the uh, small white low one that you showed earlier, what was the name of that? The, 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 the white, the round ones or the little single ones? Let me see if I can pull them back up there. Um, um, we, were, we were talking about these guys here or the, or the ball? I, well, how about both? Because the one you okay. said you liked. <laughs> well, both of them. <laughs> and then this one. This one was this one was in red, but this one is the um this is a pom pom or, or ball type. Oh the, no, it definitely the white one. Well, the, the, well yeah, the little white ones. So those are so you're gonna you can call those um so they're either gonna be they're either gonna be big known, like flaming known. That's their oh. classification that they're in. And they are um the, I like them because they're single. I like them because they're single and that's, I have a tendency personally, I, I gravitate toward, I love single roses. Um, I love lace cap hydrangeas. I love, I love single peonies. I love the single plants because they don't flop around and, and fall over like a lot of the double flowered plants do. So I really like, I really like these, these little mignons or, or singles and they're just that simple, you know, the, they got the rays around, uh, you know, the rays, single rays around the disc with the, with the rounded edges like that. I just, I think they're very pretty. They're just, there aren't a lot of, um, there aren't a lot of tall ones in this style. And a lot of people don't like the short dahlias, but I, I just, I'm a huge fan of uh, single flowers. Yeah, I think they're cute too. Absolutely. When you divide them, uh, what tool oh, yeah, do you yeah. recommend? Oh yeah, you would treat them the same as you would the other guys, for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, Amy, what tool for for dividing them in the spring? What tool do you use to divide the tubers? Like, oh, do you for, oh, for cut actually, them for actually when you're like with a knife? So mm -hmm. it's either going to be a sharp, a really sharp, you know, clean blade. Um is really going to be your best bet you know just just mm -hmm. like a paring knife or something like something like that a knife that you would even might use in the kitchen you know for, for vegetable prep would work great uh-huh um you know when you talk about the last frost date around here yeah um you're saying may 15th and i read that for just this area but when i'm driving around that time of year i notice that i i drive down towards Darien or um closer to the water 
things cool. are way ahead of us up here in um, in New Canaan and on this side of the merit. So, right. so absolutely. So, and I always use the Merritt Parkway as my point of reference. So Merritt Parkway in South is one, is a, a specific zone here. It's, it's or, you know, almost zone seven South of the Merritt Parkway. Mm -hmm. And then North of the Parkway, it's worked right into zone six. Um, we have oh. a, the, oh, the, the Long Island Sound has that much of an influence on our climate here. So yes, um, last frost date in Darien, May 15. Last frost date, New Canaan, South Salem, you know, once we get up into there, mm -hmm. I want to be surprised if it was closer to Memorial Day in some years, um, a good week to 10 days or two weeks later, for, for sure. Uh, that's a long two weeks. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> My my sister my sister and her husband just moved to Burlington in Vermont last year, and their last frost date is uh, June first. Wow! <laughs> I, I, wow! I think, yeah, I don't think I'd be able to do it. <laughs> no. Um, the uh, BT you were mentioning for the caterpillars. Yes. Is that safe for food products like kale? I have a big problem with caterpillars on my kale. You, I, I, apps, kale always has caterpillars. Kale, yeah. mm -hmm. kale, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, they all get the same caterpillar. And mm -hmm. the BT works fantastic on them. Um, cool. And it's, and the culprit is, you know, those, you know, those little white, white, yes. water sized butterflies we see flying around all over the time. That's, yeah, them. that's, them. yeah. <laughs> I know that's, that's, their, that's their offspring. Um, what about the ladybugs for the aphids? And I do know I find ladybugs for sale in the early spring, yep. but I don't really need them yet. Yeah. But then I need them in the later summer um, for the um, what is it called? The, the perennials. And yep. I, they're not anywhere. I can't find them anywhere. Yeah, you're you're only gonna find ladybugs and praying mantises and other beneficial insects for sale in the springtime. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a really, it's a really obviously they're selling live bugs in jars, and it's a really specialized business in how they collect them, how they raise them, how they package them. There, a lot of it has to do with the outside temperatures when they're shipping them you know it can't be too cold or too hot because they they typically get shipped like they come to us through uh, either fedex or ups so it if they it can't be 90 degrees in the fedex truck you know because it could kill them and it can't be wow. below freezing so there's just that that like the month of may is like their window for for shipping so it's a, it's a shipping issue for sure with the with the beneficial insects i see yeah okay um, that's all the questions that came up. Um, if anybody has another question, pop it in now. Um, as far as just a little bit of business for the members, I wanted to point out that the April program, the one that we're going to have at the library with the club, uh, that the Garden Club is hosting, um, is April 5th. I think there's been some confusion about the date on that. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and that's all. I I really appreciate you coming on, Sean. Um, I've been absolutely. looking forward to this since we started talking about it in the fall. So yeah, thank, thank you guys so much. I really enjoyed doing it. It was just the kind of it was just the kind of plant fix I needed needed today as we get ready to get into our busy spring season. So okay. I, I thank thank you so much for having me back. Thanks. And as everyone knows, we'll post this on the New Canaan Beautification League web channel, our YouTube channel, sorry, YouTube channel, and we hope that you subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And have a great day.